2 Peter chapter 1, we will be looking at verses 16 through, well, the rest of the chapter here, 21. How important is your word? I think if you're like me, your word is very important. You want to keep your word, you want people to trust your word, and so you give your word. And if you say something, you'll follow through with what you said. When people question your word, when they doubt your word, they might even sue you because of your words. That's when it hurts. Doesn't it hurt when someone doubts your words or, or thinks that you're not telling the truth or that you're insincere, you know, when you know your own heart because it's your word? How important is that to you? I think it's very important to all of us. I think it's an area that we all are very sensitive in, our own word. And yet, how much more valuable is the word of God? The one who spoke his word through men. Every word that is written in the scriptures were written by the inspiration of God through these men. And it is God's word. And his word can be taken at face value. You can guarantee that what he said is what he said. That he's not lying. He's not stretching the truth. He's not manipulating. He is telling you exactly what he thinks. He's telling you exactly what to do. He is telling you exactly his heart. And it is up to us to take him as his word. And we, we struggle with that, don't we? And yet we get upset when someone does not take us at our word. How much more should we take God at his word? Last week we looked at verse 12, which Peter said, For this reason I will not neglect to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. And so he was reminding the believers how important it is to be reminded of the truth of God because we have a tendency of forgetting. And so I remind you about, well, a couple of weeks ago when we met about what Peter was speaking before we left off and now we get into this next section of chapter 1. And so we have two points here. The word of God is the theme. Is it perspiration? Or perspiration or inspiration? Perspiration or inspiration? What do I mean by that? Is the word of God written by men? Or is the word of God inspired by God? That is the question. And that is the debate that we still have to this day. From those that don't believe the word of God to be the word of God. And to those that believe it is the word of God. The battle and debate that goes on. The evidence that is given concerning the word of God. Whether God writ it, wrote it or whether it was the disciples who wrote it. And so let's read verses 16 through 21. For we do not follow cunning devised fables. When we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellence glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit." This morning's theme is the Word of God. Now, I love the Word of God. It was, it was one of the evidences of my salvation. One of the evidences of my belief in Christianity was the Word of God. I'm a critic by heart. I don't always believe people. Uh, I always have a critical view of people. I don't really trust as much as I probably should. And so when I was introduced to the Word of God, I really didn't trust it to be the Word of God. And so in a sense, I was really trying to find evidence of it not being the Word of God. And so I began to read it. 
Uh, I, I read through the New Testament, I don't know, probably four times within several months, and then within six months reading through the whole Bible, and then every year reading it over and over and over and trying to find evidence of errors and, and problems and, and various things. And um, I haven't been able to find any. Now, there might be some <clears throat> some translational, you know, from one copy to another air like 10,000 to maybe a thousand but that doesn't take away from the context it doesn't take away from what is being said it was just leaving out a letter I remember hearing a story about uh, some monks who were gathering together and they were rewriting the scriptures and they would rewrite the scriptures from these copies uh, year after year after year after year and finally one monk just thought about it wait a minute aren't we copying a copy shouldn't we copy the original instead of the copy and the head monk said, wow, that's, that's a good idea. Uh, the reason that we copied a copy was we didn't want to you know, ruin the original. So he went back to the archives and he pulled up the originals and he started looking through, spent days and days and days. And the monk finally were curious and they, they, they went down there to see what was going on. And there was the head monk and he was just pounding his head, pounding his head, pounding his head, pounding his head. Like, what happened? What happened? We made an error. And he says, well, what, what was it? And he goes, well, one word. We left out an E and celebrate, and that was it. And he was so upset. And in reality, that's how the Jews were in copying the manuscripts. They would copy the manuscripts literally from the original. And if they made one error, they would literally take the whole manuscript and throw it away, and they would start over. Now, you have to understand, they used scrolls back then. And so they would start in the beginning, Genesis, and and keep writing. And when they get to Exodus and then Leviticus, and they're rolling the scrolls, they're writing. And if they made a mistake, they roll the scroll up and throw it away. And they start over again, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Because they didn't want any mistakes whatsoever. Now, we have found one of those scrolls. Um, They have a scroll that was thrown away. And when you roll it out, they actually have all the marks where all the errors are to show you the errors within the scriptures. But it's interesting because um, the errors in those scriptures have nothing to do with the context and, and, and what the theme of the message is. They're all errors like a letter being left out or a, a added letter or an S on the end, you know, something like that. And I'm, I'm giving you the English translation compared to the Hebrew, you know, the, the way that they make the lines and so forth. So again, it was thrown out because it didn't meet it exactly the way that it was supposed to be. And I have found that people who say that this book has errors are people who say this secondhand information. They say it because someone else told them that. And they believe that someone else. But if you ask them, show me where that error is, show it to me. They won't be able to show you because they've never read the Bible. They haven't studied it, and they're just believing somebody else instead of looking into it themselves. So I love the Word of God, and I have read it over and over again, and I'm being sincere with you, and I don't expect you to believe me. I expect you to prove me wrong, and in fact, I challenge you to prove me wrong. Find somewhere in scriptures that you think there is an error in, and I will believe you, but I'm telling you, there is no errors within the scriptures. They flow perfectly as one letter is written from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And so because Peter here takes the presence of the word over his own experience, he talks about the importance of the word of God. Perspiration. Verse 16, let's look at this. Is it written by man? Well, Peter immediately makes this statement in verse 16. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables. Interesting. The word follow there in the Greek means to follow out to a conclusion, to pursue a line of thought to its termination. That's what the word follow means. In other words, we didn't follow something all the way to its conclusion. Um, Nothing that was cunningly devised by men because immediately critical thinking and logical thinking prove that it was not true and there was no need to follow it completely out because it was cunning in other words it was artfully framed by human cleverness and they were myths the word fable there and so what peter's saying here is that we as disciples did not follow 
somebody's man-made religious system that cunningly devised it behind back rooms to manipulate people because that is a myth. Peter and the, the other apostles understood that it wasn't a fairy tale, that what they were following was the truth because they had firsthand information. They walked with Jesus Christ, which was probably the most powerful evidence that anyone would ever need. If they had followed fables, if they had devised these cunning devices, you would think that they wouldn't have given up their lives for a lie. You see, if I tell a lie, and if I make up a religious system, and then they come and they threaten to kill me, or die for your system, I would probably say, no, I don't want to die. It's false. I made it up. I don't believe it. But yet every disciple died for their faith in Jesus Christ, willingly. Peter was hung upside down. Paul was beheaded. Thomas went to India, and he was a martyr over there. Everyone died because of what they believed in. Now, what Peter is talking about was this belief back then and it was going around, probably stemmed from some of the Greek philosophies and so forth, where they believed that men <clears throat> were given to this earth and became gods. And the priests were then to take this and they were to, um, this philosophy, and, and teach it to others within the community of the church. And so this idea of men becoming gods, and there would be many gods, within the church itself. And so Peter's saying that is a cunningly devised fable that men have made up and brought to the church. And he says, we have not followed anything like that because ours has substance, ours has truth, ours has evidence. And I can go down the line and just give you the evidence, um, historical evidence. Uh, the, the word of God has so much historical evidence in it. You know, we were talking at the men's, men's uh, retreat on Friday night. And I was sharing with them about the, the flood. I'm sorry, not the flood, the, um, the dividing of the Red Sea. And how Pharaoh was swallowed up by the water. And his men were swallowed by the water. Well, there's a historical document that says that during that time, uh, there was a neighboring nation that came into Egypt and conquered it without any resistance whatsoever. And that's interesting. Because if you think about this, why didn't they have any resistance? Because there was no Pharaoh or or army in Egypt because they were in the flood and so they came into Egypt and just took it over like that no one was there to protect it historical evidence of the account of the flood it took place yeah. and so there's so much historical evidence Pontius Pilate for years they would say there is no Pontius Pilate we have no evidence of Pontius Pilate you know and so thus the scriptures are wrong it's in error and so forth well as they continue to excavate in Israel they were there by the sea in Canaan, and as they were excavating, they found this big rock that was a plaque, and it said, Pontius Pilate, governor, right there written. And so, of course, you don't hear anything like, oh, we were wrong, and blah, 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 but there it was, the evidence there. The Bible doesn't need to be proved um, by any of us because it is the word of God. But it's interesting that historically, you will continue to find evidence of the word of God. Um, prophetically, and Peter's going to talk about it prophetically, uh, just prophetically. Now, a lot of us might read Ann Landers, we might read the horoscope, we might read some of these uh, uh, articles that try to predict our future, you know, and give you a good life, and hopefully read your palms, and those type of things, and we put weight into some of that stuff, but the Word of God, prophetically, when it when it prophesies of something happening in the future, predicts something happening in the future, it comes to true a hundred percent at the time a hundred percent jesus alone his whole birth and his whole existence was predicted something like uh 328 times something like that every prediction about jesus came true the odds of that is one to like the 157th power which is like impossible it would be like you taking a silver dollar and putting it three feet high on the whole state of Texas, and then someone flying you over to Russia, and then going back to Texas and taking a mark dollar, sticking it in there, and telling you, 
as they bring you back, okay, find that one dollar that's marked. That would be impossible. And yet, that's the odds of Jesus fulfilling all the prophetic scriptures written about him prophetically. There is so much evidence of the word of God. We have documents of some of the earlier manuscripts in museums that people don't even know they're there because the media doesn't tell you about it, the education system doesn't tell you about it, but yet they're there. And we're, they're never known to us because we don't explore these things out. It was, um, his name will come to me, Josh McDowell, who found out that they, they had these little Egyptian masks and I think I shared this with you a year or two ago, Egyptian masks. Well, they started to look at these Egyptian masks, and these Egyptian masks were written right around the time after Christ and the disciples. And they started to take the mask, and they began to peel the layers away from the mask because they wanted to see what was, what was used to make these masks. Well, they were newspaper writings, in a sense. You know, like we do with paper mache and we stick it in starch, you know, and we start making masks or piñatas and all of those various things. Well, this is how they made the mask. Well, these masks were made in Egypt, and they're worth a lot of money today. Well, as they began to put moisture into the mask, and they allowed the moisture to get in between the pages, and they start peeling the pages, what they found is these masks were made out of scriptures, New Testament scriptures. The New Testament was flowing throughout all of Egypt, that's how far the gospel was going out. And there were so many New Testament scriptures flowing, these epistles and the gospels flowing out there that they were very much available like a newspaper that people were taking them and making masks with these papers. The evidence is there because there are those who will say, well, we don't really have the original documents of the New Testament. And we don't, but we have copies of them. We have more copies of the New Testament than we have evidence that Caesar Nero existed. And yet none of us will debate that Caesar Nero existed or Rome existed. And yet we have more evidence of the word of God. Now, the only conclusion I draw is is that men don't want to believe that God has given us a word because they don't want their lives to be governed by God. They want to be their own gods. So Peter says, we did not follow cunningly devised fables. We are, as believers are not to follow superheroes. There's a big push today. Superheroes, Batman, you know, Superman, the Avengers. You know, and we all follow them. Now, I'm one of those guys, I like superheroes because it's, it's a positive story. It's somebody who fights against evil and they are victorious over evil, you know, and they rip their shirt open, the big S, and so we wear S's. You know, we wear Batman uh, attire and various things like that. But we're not to follow that. We're not to make them the, our gods. We know that that's a fairy tale. You know, they're just fairy tale fictional books that are written. You know, and yet the world goes out and tries to find Superman out there. Uh, the author of some of these movies has literally gone out and sent someone, go find superheroes out in the world. And he finds people like that. There was one guy who was a runner. And your body, as you run, it secretes this certain enzyme in your muscles. And as long as it's secreting that enzyme, your muscles don't tighten up. Uh, they don't get sore. Uh, most of us will, will dipis- di- dissipate that that whatever it is, that enzyme in our body within several miles of running, and that's why we stop, because we get tired, our muscles start to ache. Well, this guy, for some reason, his enzymes continue on, so he runs day and night without ever stopping. And so he's like a superhero, you know. And and people idolize those things. We are not to idolize superheroes. We are not to get our direction from palm readings. Going to somebody and they look at your palm. Oh, you have a long lifeline. You know, you got a break there. Oh, you're going to be married at this age and something's going to happen here. We're not to follow those things. We're not to follow those zodiac signs when you open up the paper and there I am, a Scorpio. Okay, today I need to be careful who I talk to, you know, and those type of things. We're not to follow that stuff. Those are fairy tales, those are fads and theories, they're fables that are not true, that are not based upon evidence, but are based upon man's idea in their system. And when you look at the world system, you really see that these things are devised by them. You look at some of the religious systems, 
that we see out there. You know, we have Christianity, Protestant. Of course, you have Catholicism, which is the biggest religion because of Constantine. But from that came Protestants, which I believe um, were the men and women that dedicated their lives to just the word of God and not necessarily to man-made religions and, and, and regulations and rules like Catholicism got into. I was speaking with somebody just the other day, and they were saying that they actually went through um, Catholic school all of their life, even into college, and never once did they open up the Bible. It was always their doctrines and sacraments and all their other man-made uh, rules that came in afterwards. But you look at those religions, Jehovah Witness is another one, well, aren't they Christian? Aren't Mormons Christian? You know, And you look at all of those, and you find out that they have taken the scriptures, and they have added to it. They have added to it. Jehovah Witnesses have taken away from it. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, they put the Word was a God. That little word, a, means a lot. And you tell them about it, so you believe there are more gods. Oh, no, 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 we only believe there's Jehovah God, one God. Well, why'd you put an a there? Because in the Greek, it belongs there. No, it doesn't. You're lying. And even the Protestant Christian church says, let's go to court and let's prove it before the court system. Oh, no, we don't want to do that. We don't take anything to court. We don't believe in government. We don't do all that. Why? Because if you go to court with all the evidence and the the manuscripts, they will find out that an A doesn't belong there. Same with Jehovah Witness. Same with all of these other religious systems. They're man-made. Evolution. A fairy tale. It is a fairy tale that we evolve from this cells in the ocean that turned into a polywog that came up on the ground and began to grow lungs and breathe and, and all of a sudden hop like a frog on the land and then eventually evolved into this wonderful man and then this wonderful woman. It's all fairy tale. And we have a fairy tale like that, right? And you have a princess who finds a frog and what does the princess do? Kiss the frog. Why? So it turns into a prince. And that's evolution right there. I mean, taken straight from a fairy tale and brought into the school system as a scientific, you know, theory. The word theory means theory. No matter what you, you say about it, it's a theory. And it's not a proven theory, no matter how long we wait for it. The Bible is historically and factually actual. Factual and reliable and without error when you really consider it. And I really believe that if you're really sincere and you want to give up your sins, that God will make it real to you. It's really up to you. So Peter says, look, it's not perspiration. It's not a cunningly devised fable. He says, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's talking about that transfiguration that he experienced with um, Jesus Christ. He says, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That is, Peter and James and John were there on this mountain when Jesus transfigured from this earthly body to his new body in his presence. And God, his Father, spoke to them. He was right there. And it was with power and might and strength, not a fable, not a fairy tale. And it is the power of God that saves. It is the power of God that changes men. It is not the perspiration of men that changes us because it fails you. Religion will always fail you, always. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ that will always give you victory. It's by inspiration. And so Peter says in verse 17, for he, that is Jesus, received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my son, beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so Peter recounts that Mount of Transfiguration story. Five times in the New Testament you find God talking about his son that he was well pleased with him. Matthew 13, uh, 17, Mark 1, Luke 3. And they all talk about as he was being baptized and the father sent the dove and he said, this is my son. At times you say, this is my well 
beloved son. Listen to him. And there at the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter and James as witnesses. Turn to Matthew really quick, 17. And let's just read that really quick because Peter is referring to this situation here. And it's quite an, quite an uh, a emotional experience that he has. So much so that he reminds the readers of this experience. And I'm saying the word experience for a reason because it is a dramatic experience that he will never forget, but yet he's going to put something above that experience and that is the word of God and remind us that there's something even more sure than our experiences. That is the word of God. In 17 it says, After six days Jesus took Peter... James and John, his brother, led them up to a high mountain on them, by themselves, and he was transfigured. Now, the word transfigured there means he was transformed into another glory in the Greek. In other words, he totally became the glorified Christ. Totally white. He glowed. Not the, not the glory that Moses experienced when he went to the mountain and he came down with the glory of God and it began to fade away, but with the glory that he will be glorified uh, in the resurrection day. It says, Before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Uh, and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Now, that would really change your perspective, wouldn't you? Wouldn't it? If Moses all of a sudden appeared, and then Elijah appeared, I mean, you're talking a thousand years later, and there's Moses, who talked with the burning bush there on Mount Sinai, and there's Elijah, the prophet of God, who was taken up by a chariot of fires, you know, and now they're standing before you, and you're Peter, you're James and John, you're going, wow, this is amazing, this is amazing, I want to stay here for a while. Then Peter answered and said, Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And then the disciples heard it. They fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. So you're looking at Moses and then you're looking at Elijah and you're watching Jesus shining like the sun and you're going, this is awesome. Let's make tents. Let's live up here. Let's stay here forever. You know, let's, just, let, let's just dwell here in the presence of Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And then all of a sudden, God's voice from heaven begins to speak about his son. And they go, oh my God. And they fall on their faces and they begin to weep and cry and praise and fearful of what is taking place at that very moment. And then Jesus comes and touches them and says, don't fear. What an experience. What an experience that is. I was telling the guys when we were up there at the men's retreat this weekend, <clears throat> I was up there Friday night, and the reason that I didn't stay uh, overnight was I didn't want to take somebody's spot. They only had room for 15 people, and so I decided to drive up there, not spend the night so that someone else could spend the night and enjoy it. So um, I went up a little bit earlier, and I'm very familiar with the area because I worked up there. I know all the ins and outs and the various places and so forth. And so as I was going up Highway 18 along the, uh, the side of the mountain overlooking San Bernardino, taking some pictures and just remembering all the times I've been up there and thunderstorms and clear days at night and things like that, it just brought back a lot of memories. And then I kind of missed the um, turn to go to uh, Lake Arrowhead. I kind of passed it. And so as I passed it, I knew where I was at. I didn't feel worried, you know, because I've been there many, many times. And so I just kept going, and I came down another road. And I ended up at the village there in Arrowhead, and then I followed another road that went, finally went back to the North Bay area where the lake was. And as I was coming around the North Bay Road there where the home was at, I started remembering the retreat that I went to 25 years ago in that same area. And so I was looking for the house and I didn't see it, so it must have been past it. And so I found the, the place that the guys were at and went there and, and just was really emotionally moved because I remember 25 years ago being at a men's retreat with about 15 to 20 guys, several pastors, Calvary Chapel pastors. Now at that time, Calvary Chapel pastors uh, in this area were a lot smaller, 
you know, like Dave Rosales had maybe three, four hundred people at the time. Um, Jimmy, the same thing, Arate, Fausto Fluker, and so forth. So these guys, their passion and love for the Word of God, they would just come out and teach because they just loved it without charging or, or any, any other reasons, you know, because they just loved teaching the Word and blessing. They were being used of God in a great way. And I remember being up there, and I was telling the guys, I said, this weekend, guys, this is going to be a weekend that you remember. God is going to move in your life. So 25 years ago, I was in a meeting just like this with pastors and worship. Now, I don't remember the teachings. I don't remember them at all. I don't even remember all the faces. I can't even hardly remember who was there teaching. But I do remember Fausto Fluker teaching because he prayed for me. And there was a prophetic word on my life and what God was going to do. And I didn't forget that. It changed my life. I said, now the men that were there with me were various ages from elderly men to very young men. I was 26 right around there at that time. And I went with a desire to hear from God. And I told them, a lot of those men, I don't know where they're at. Some of them have fallen away. Some of them are serving the Lord. I know one man who's pastoring a church in Mariloma because he wanted God to move in his life. And I challenged him. I said, if you want God to move in your life, then this weekend you will remember the rest of your life because God will move. He will move. It was that type of experience that I had with the Lord and the men up there. And I hope that they have that too. That was a type of experience that Peter had. To see Moses, Elijah, and then the Father speak, I mean, you just can't beat that. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that Peter says, there's no way anybody's going to convince me that Jesus is not the Messiah. <laughs> there's just no way that he didn't come to save the world from its sins. There's just no way. No one's going to ever convince me that the word of God is not the word of God. There's just no way. I mean, I was there. <laughs> I heard God's voice. I fell on my face in fear. You know, I mean, there's just no way. The evidence was, was too great. And yet, we see his insight. Listen to what he says in verse 19. And so we have, you can turn back to Second Peter. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. In other words, this evidence, his conclusion of all this evidence and this experience of the Father and Elijah and Moses just confirmed the word of God. But even more sure than Peter's personal experience was the testimony of God's word who, of who Jesus was. See, it was not his experience, but it was the confirmation of the experience by the word of God, by God himself. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. That's the word of God. Experiences cannot confirm the word of God at all times are experiences. And we can't depend upon experiences. If you depend on experiences, then you're not depending on the word of God and you will be disappointed from time to time. The children of Israel probably depended on experiences more than anyone else in the world. So divide the Red Sea. We need water. Water comes from rock. We need to eat. Quails fall down before them. You know, we need fruit. You know, in the promised land, there's grapes and there's huge amounts of it, you know, so it's coming. And they saw miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And when they get to the promised land, what do they do? We can't go in. Why? Because we have lack of faith. Experiences doesn't give you the faith. Believing God's word gives you the faith and gives you the strength. You have to believe his word. It is a sure word. It is a solid word. This is what Paul said. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. 2 Timothy 3.16. Not some scripture, but all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Yes, men wrote it down, but it, they were inspired by God to write this down into various historical books and epistles and letters. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so reading the word of God is good for us because it teaches us truth, doctrine. It teaches us what we should believe in. It also reproves us in that what we do believe isn't right and we need to stop believing that. It also corrects us. If we're on the wrong path, we need to get off that path and be corrected. And it instructs us how we should be righteous people. 
It's what the Word of God does. Jesus said this when he was on his way to the mountain. You remember he was fasting and praying. And the devil came and he tempted him with bread. He said, look, if you're hungry, just turn this bread, you know, or the stone into bread and, and eat. And Jesus basically told the devil, look, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so Jesus himself knew how valuable the word of God was. And so he said, basically, look, even food is not important compared to the word of God. If you're starving, oh, well, at least you have the word of God to be fed on. It's that important. McGee said this, the Bible is a God book and a man book. It deals with human life right down where you and I live and moves and have our being. Yet, it is God speaking to man in a language that is understandable to him. It's a God book and it's a man book. And it's a book that I believe and I put all of my weight upon. Every bit of it. I would rather believe the word of God than the word of man. And I try to live my life according to the Word of God. And it's what we should all do. So the Word of God is more sure than our experiences. He goes on and says, Which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, or a murky place. I like the word murky place. Because the world is a murky place. Not necessarily you know, a dark place, which it is dark and it's evil in places, but murky where you can kind of see. And men try to make up their own little moral values and their little systems. And Well, I'm an okay guy because you know, I've never killed, but yet you hate people. You know, but I've never committed adultery, yet you lust for women. You know, I've never done those things because our life is murky. And God's light shines within the murkiness of our world, in a sense. Matthew talks about how a great light uh, came to Zebulon and Nebula there, and yet uh, the people were in darkness and wouldn't receive it, speaking of Jesus Christ being that light. And so we should, we should be, be doing the word of God and not just hearing the word of God, as James would say. Peter said, it would do us well to heed it. In other words, you would be blessed to live your life according to the word of God. Otherwise, you'll still be in a murky place. And he goes on and says, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Well, what does he mean there? Well, the day dawns pictures this light breaking through the, the gloomy day of, uh, uh, of a murky night. And so it's dawning, it's starting to open up. And what it's speaking of is the day that Jesus comes back. When that day comes, then it's all over. Then we'll be in his presence it says, and the morning star rises in our hearts. So it's a metaphor that he's using concerning the word of God. Jesus was called the bright and morning star in Revelation 22. Uh, he was transformed into, a, in a sense, a, a sun because he shone like the sun in the Mount of Transfiguration. And so what he was saying here is that as long as the word of God can go out, the day is being dawn, receive it into your hearts because the Lord's coming back soon when it's too late. So he says in verse 20, knowing this first, so this, consider this first, this is very important, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now he goes back to verse 16, when he talked about cunningly devised fables. He says, look, no Scripture is of private interpretation. You cannot interpret it privately. God has written his word very clearly, very simply, so that we all come to the same conclusion when we read it. We should all be able to read it together, study it together, and agree upon it together. That's how simply it was read it, written for us. Not one verse that only one man can interpret. And what Peter's saying here is that no one portion of the Scripture is to be interpreted apart from the other references of the Scripture. The Bible interprets the Bible. And so one book is interpreted by another book. The Old Testament is right in line with the New Testament, and that's why they call it the Old Testament, New Testament, but it's the same book, and it all flows together completely. And the meaning is evidence for all of us to understand and see. And that's why Calvary Chapel really believes that that we are committed to teaching the Bible book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, because it's all of God's word for a life. And he goes on, so knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, 
For prophecy never came by the will of man. Now prophecy obviously is not from the will of man. It's something that some outer being gives to that person to speak. That's why they call it prophecy. And so prophecy is not or did not come from the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so he gives us and interprets to us how the scriptures were written right here. Men were moved to write these things down by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who is the author of the scriptures. And he wrote these things through men. Now how does that work? I used to, I used to work for a library when libraries existed um, <clears throat> a lot more back then. And I used to actually uh, take old old films that you see in, in your classroom, the old digital or, or old uh, real films, and they would break, you know, and so I would glue them back together and paste them, you know, so they can show them over and over again. That was my job as a teenager. And there was a lady there that knew shorthand, and I thought that was so intriguing that she knew shorthand. So she would go to her boss, you know, that had a letter that needed to be written, and she'd sit down, and he'd just start talking, you know, uh, to whom it may concern, and he'd just go, whoa, whoa, and I'm listening to this, and she's just writing, I'm like, how is she keeping up with him? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So afterwards, I just kind of asked her, and she was probably in her 80s back then, it seemed like it to me, here was a teenager, you know. And so I asked her, and she showed me, and it was just a bunch of little marks on a paper, little lines. I'm like, what is that? She goes, it's shorthand. This is how we as secretaries write down the notes for what we're going to type up when they are dictating to us what to write. And so he dictated a letter. It came from him to her. She wrote it down and then sent it out. Whoever it went to reads it. And they know that it came from him, not her. That's what the Holy Spirit has done. The word of God has come from the Holy Spirit who gave it to men to write down, which they wrote down, which we read, which we know didn't come from them. It came from him, God in heaven. That's how it was written for us. And so Peter says, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now let me give you a scripture to prove that in Acts. Luke said this in Acts 1.16, Men and brethren, this scripture has been fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas Iscariot. And so Luke tells the early church, look, Judas Iscariot falling away, the, the, the whole betrayal thing, that was written beforehand by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David. See, that's how God wrote the word of God. The word inspiration defined is the act of God by which he is directly controlling the writer so that what was written originally autographed was free from error. That's actually the definition of inspiration. You go to a Webster's dictionary and that's what you find because they understood that to be true. According to Green, an ancient Greek word translated moved has a sense of carrying along as a ship being carried along by the wind or the current. And so the, the word move there is talking about how a ship is carried along as it goes by what? The wind and not by the ship. And so it is the Holy Spirit who gave the word to man to write down. And we know that to be the truth. That is how the scriptures came about. Now, we're challenged to believe that or not to believe it. I have seen, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but, uh, or even know the term. Do you know the term automatic writing? You guys ever hear the term automatic writing? It is where an individual will actually go into a trance, hypnotic trance, and he will be in this hypnotic trance. They'll have a pencil in his hand, and all of a sudden he'll just start writing. He'll just start writing. And he's in this trance. And it's a demonic trance is what it is. And it's called automatic writing. It is a fabrication of what God had did through the Holy Spirit by the demons. And some believe that the Anton LaVey's, the Satanic Bible, was written that way. Through a de- demon who went in and possessed this person and he just began to write. Look, at, look it up. Look into it. It happens today. So if we know that it happens today falsely, you know, anti Christ type, you know, a situation. We know that truthfully, authentically, 
God had the original idea. And so through the Holy Spirit, and of course through men who were willing and in tune with God, faithful men that loved the Lord, they were able to write the scriptures down. Now, not in the sense of automatic writing where the Spirit just took them, but through their daily activities. Because when you read the Word of God, it's like a historical book. And God just told these guys to write down what was taking place in these men's lives as he was using men throughout the, the centuries and they began to write this stuff down. And in between these, these, these stories, there would be prophetic words of Christ. You know, they say, why is that in there? You know, the Spirit just put it in there and it spoke of Christ coming in the future. You know, and you would see these things throughout as you read in the Old Testament. And it's God speaking to us and giving us the evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointing one. And that's what Peter is doing here to the early church. They're struggling. He's at the end of his life and he's encouraging them and reminding them. And one of the reminders is, this is the word of God, the sure word. We can depend upon it. We can live our lives by it and be blessed by it. The opposite is true also. If you don't, then you live a murky life. You live a murky life. You're not deceiving anybody. If you're not living by the word of God, then your life is, is a life that's kind of murky. Uh, you're not being blessed. You're struggling. Uh, you're stressed. You're upset. Things aren't going right. Things don't make sense. It's because you're not living according to the word of God. Because God promises us that if we live by his word, he will bless us. <clears throat> God says in his word, Ezekiel eighteen twenty, the soul that sins shall die. Is that true? God said it. The soul that sins shall die. If you're a sin in sin this morning, then I pray that you would confess it before the Lord. Otherwise, you'll die. God wants to save you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you. And in order to have life, you must repent from your sin and turn to God and he will save you.